Hello, welcome to today's program of Grafted In. I'm Jordan Long and this is Sherry Robes. We're coming to discuss with you some of the things that we began last week on this broadcast. We started last week a series on talking about the month of Elul, the Hebrew month Elul. Um, it is the last month of the Hebrew calendar. Um, it is the month of preparation for the coming high holidays of Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Trumpets, all the, all the fall feast, uh, festivals. Um, so we began talking about that last week, and we wanted to continue on with that this week. Um, before we get into the broadcast, I'd like to just recap some uh, things that Pastor Don and Donna have talked about before about the, the Hebrew festivals. Um, so I would like you to read for us, Sherry, Leviticus chapter 23. All right, starting at verse 1. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The set feasts or appointed seasons of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, even my set feasts are these. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation or assembly by summons. You shall do no work on that day. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the set feasts or appointed seasons of the Lord. Holy convocations you shall proclaim at their stated times. Okay, and then jump down to verse 20, what is it? 23. 23. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the first day of the seventh month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial day announced by blowing of trumpets, a holy called assembly. You shall do no, no servile work on it, but you shall present an offering made by fire to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, also the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy called assembly, and you shall afflict yourselves by fasting and penitence and humility, and present an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on this day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on this day shall be cut off from among his people, that he may not be included in the atonement made for them. And whoever does any work on that same day, I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no kind of work on that day. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict yourself by fasting and penitence and humility. On the ninth day of the month, from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. So I just wanted to recap that real quick because um, a lot of people ask, why, why are we talking about the festivals? Aren't those Jewish feasts? Um, but we see throughout Leviticus 23 where it says, the Lord is speaking. He says, these are my feasts. These are my set times. These are my appointed times. The, that word in Hebrew is moed. These are my moedim. Um, so it's, it's like if you have a, a doctor's appointment um, you show up at the time that they tell you. You don't show up, um, say they gave you an appointment at two, on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. Well, if you show up on Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you, you would be on the wrong right. time. Right. You wouldn't have your appointment. Um, so if, we're, if we are the children of God, truly we are through Yeshua the Messiah, um, we need to find out what are the set feasts of the family. We have been grafted in, as the broadcast name is, grafted in. Um, we have been grafted into a family, and we want to find out the customs of the family, what, what our, our Heavenly Father has set as um, customs of the family. So in uh, what she was reading in Leviticus, it goes into talking about the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement. Those are what's coming up in um, just a couple weeks they yes. start. So um, we are right in the middle of a, a month of preparation. We talked on the last broadcast about how it is a month when they talk about how the king is in the field. And um, we, we stressed that, that, that it's, it's a time when God is, uh, in the Jewish mind, nearer to us. Now we know that we always have an open door. Yes. Through the blood of Yeshua, we always have an open door of access to Abba. And the, it's not limited to a certain time of the year. But the, there are, it's good to have things that um, stir up our memory of yeah. it, that, that, that provoke in our mind um, the thought of getting closer. The importance of certain times that he's set throughout right. the year. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a... Um, it comes more of a focal point for us right. to get focused in on this time. Right. Okay. This is a, a this is a time like with the month of the Lul. Mm -hmm. We have all this all these days mm -hmm. to really focus on and be in an awareness of. Okay. This is 
this is our days that we can focus on preparation, That's right. focus on um, getting right with ABBA, getting right mm -hmm. with, with others, focus on getting back onto the right path. That's right. And this, this is the season of that. This is, this is the season that Abba set up specifically for that time. And he said he is the Lord, he does not change. That's right. So even though we have come into the new covenant, there are still things, they talk about how those are shadows of things to come. They are still relevant for us today. So what we do here at Faith Christian Church a lot is we look into the feast and find out how can we apply these to our lives spiritually, our walk with Abba. That's right, yeah. And as we learn to apply them, we find ourselves um, continu continuing on with a journey that mm -hmm. just keeps opening more doors right. and, and gets us more um, into realms of things where just more of the blessing of these moeds yeah. is opened up to us. Right. And, and to understand things through Hebrew, a Hebrew mindset, yeah. um, how, how Abba intended the word to say, it, it, it brings such a new life to it Definitely. that I don't think that we had before we, we started this right. journey. And, and as you said, it is a journey. And, and each time we come through the years and we come through the, the, the cycle of the festivals again, it's like it's an ascending cycle. Exactly. It's like we come to um, Yom Kippur one year and we're higher than we were last right. year. We have more of a revelation, more of a, a depth. And all of it is to connect with Abba. That's right. that, is, yeah. that is the purpose of it all, that we may become one with him. That was the purpose that he created the Day of Atonement. That's why he made a Day of Atonement, to bring us back into unity with him. That's right. the word atonement, at one meant. Right. It's to become one with him again. Right, and like you were saying, the, the ascending of going up. Um, up as we come mm -hmm. through each year of celebrating these things. We find that, you know, last year when we celebrated these feasts, we just saw there was new, awesome, amazing things mm -hmm. that happened. And it just seems that we keep, we keep, as each year comes on and we go into each festival of the new, different years, that just Abba just brings, um, he just brings to us this, these awesome mm -hmm. new things. That's right. And each time it just keeps getting better and better and better. That's right. Um, last week on the broadcast, we talked about an, um, the Jewish heart, and I had read an article about it, and I'm going to real quickly reread that, re -read that article just to um, bring us back to the point where we left off. Um, love, it is the most powerful of human emotions. We all crave it. We cannot live without it. And yet it is so overwhelming, so all-encompassing, that there is no way to measure it, prove it, define it, or even describe it. When we speak of the intellect, it is represented by the mind. And we speak of the emotions, specifically of love, they are represented by the heart. But why? The symbol of the heart is probably one of the most well-known symbols, spanning continents, cultures, religions, languages. That little red heart means love. It is used to sign letters to represent the word love itself and has inundated the buyer's market by being plastered on cards, t-shirts, necklaces, balloons, and just about everything else. How is the image of the heart, as we most commonly know it, the symbol for this passionate experience of love? The month that we are now in, Elul, is the key to unlocking the inner and most potent meaning of the heart. As is well known, the Hebrew letters that make the word Elul, Aleph, Lamed, Vav, and Lamed, are an acronym for the phrase from the biblical song of songs, Ani Ladodi Vedodi Li which means I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me. This beautiful phrase, which represents our relationship with our creator, is often paralleled to that of a husband and wife, a bride and a groom. The Zohar explains that at the beginning of Elul, we are Achor El Achor, meaning back to back, and by the end of Elul, we are Panim El Panim, face to face. But how can it be that we are back to back? Wouldn't that imply that God has his back turned to us as well? How can we say such a thing when this is the month which the king is in the field? Is it not the month when God is more accessible than ever, when he is waiting for us to greet him, when he is there for us in the field of our everyday lives? The fact that we are described as back to back and then face to face is an amazing lesson. Often when we feel hurt, angry, abandoned, whatever the root of our pain may be, we turn our back. When our back is turned, we have no idea of the state of the other. And it is often easier to believe that we are not the only one with the turned back. 
It is easier to think the other has also turned around, that the other isn't facing us at all, because if that is the case, then even if we turn around, it won't help, so why bother? Why make that first move only to turn around and see the back of the other? But this ra rationalization is the cause of many unsettled arguments, hurt feelings, and broken relationships. How classic is the scene played out endlessly in movies of the couple who walk away from one another. At some point, the man turns around wanting to call her name, ask for another chance, beg for forgiveness. He is about to speak, but realizes that her back is turned. She is walking away. He tells himself that it is too late. She just doesn't care. So he turns back around. Seconds later, she turns to look at him. She doesn't want this to end. She wants to say something, but can't garner the courage. She doesn't have the strength. And why? Why should she when his back is turned? The month of Elul teaches us the necessity of being willing to turn around. She looks at him longingly, but doesn't, it doesn't matter. She assumes he couldn't care less as he continues to walk away from her. And we, the viewers, sit on the edge of our seats, hoping that maybe they will both turn around at the same time, that they'll finally realize that the other does care, that even though they appear to be back to back, they really want to be face to face. Sometimes that fairy tale ending does happen. Other times they simply continue to walk in opposite directions right out of each other's lives. It is the month of Elul that teaches us the necessity of being willing to turn around. The king is our in the field. Our creator is here. And no matter how we may feel, he has never had his back turned. All we need to do is turn ourselves around to realize that he is there and waiting for us. The back-to-back -back that we experience in the beginning of the month is based on our misperceptions, our fears, and our assumptions. Only when we turn around do we realize the truth, the inner essence, and then we are face-to-face, -face, which does not only mean that we can finally look at each other, but more so that we can look in each other. For the root of the word face, panim, is the same as panim yot, which means innerness. So now the question is how this lesson is taught to us, not only in the month of Elul, but through the name Elul itself. As we said above, the word Elul is comprised of an Aleph, followed by a Lamed, followed by a Vav, followed by the final letter, another Lamed. The first letter in Elul is also the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The letter Aleph is numerically equivalent to one, which represents the idea of God's total unity. So now, uh, here, is what our Lamed, here is where our Lameds are once again defined. At this point, it is important to think again about the symbol of the heart and to question its origin. And so it should be no surprise that the meaning of this symbol will once again be found in the word for heart itself. In Hebrew, the word for heart is lev, which is spelled lamed bait. Rabbi Abu, Abu Lafia, in the year 1291, wrote a manuscript by the name of Imri Shefer, in which he describes the meaning of the heart. The word lev, lamed bait, needs to be understood as two lameds. This is because the letter bait is the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet and numerically equivalent to two. So he explains that the word needs to be read and understood as two lameds. But it's not enough to have two lameds. In order for there to be a relationship, the two lameds need to be connected. They need to be face to face. When we turn around the second lamed to face the first, we form the image of the Jewish heart. Uh, and then it goes into talking about how, how, how they, they see the connection between all the Hebrew letters and what it means. It teaches us that the, the heart can thrive when there's only a totality and connections. Um, so that's why Elul is the month that begins back to back and ends face to face. At the beginning of the month, we are totally unaware of the reality that I'm to my beloved and my beloved is to me. However, by working on ourselves this month, by being willing to turn around and make changes, we come to realize that our Creator has never had His back turned. He has always been facing us and waiting for us to turn around. And once we do, we are then like the two Lamids that are face to face, which form the Jewish heart and which are the essence of the month of Elul. So I just kind of wanted to recap that, that story because I think it's a really good picture of, of, of our journey and how, how the, the whole um, goal of this time is for us to come face to face with Abba. Yeah. If there's any, any areas in our life where we may have been holding back a part of us from him, yeah. 
to come to that place where we're connected with him. And really that goes back down to the Hebrew word that is most heard throughout this month, teshuva. The Hebrew word teshuva comes from the root word shuv, which means to return. It literally, it's the word for repentance that's translated repentance. But that's the part that we want to get into talking about today, because I think a lot of us kind of have a Western mindset on repentance yeah, that is totally um, unlike what Abba had intended. Yeah, definitely, because Abba's his form of repentance, or his his way of putting out repentance is it's it all comes back to love. Mm -hmm. It's all connected with love, right. and like we were talking about, you know. If anybody in the relationship has their back turned and walk away, walks away, it's us. That's right. He's, ne he's the God who will never leave us nor forsake us. He, no matter what we may do, the most worst thing we could possibly ever do, he is always going to be facing us. Mm -hmm. And we're the ones who, you know, get the tendency to, you know, walk down the wrong way, do the wrong thing and stuff, and walk away from him. Mm -hmm. And walk away from him. When you're walking away from someone, your back is turned to them. That's right. And as we're walking away, he's standing there always facing forward us. That's right. And, and as always, at any time, at any moment, no matter what we do, we have this repentance that he has given forth because he will never turn his back on That's us. Right. He is, his, his, his arms are always open lovingly, with love, waiting for us to turn around and come that's back. That's right. And, and, and that's, the, again, the picture of the prodigal son that we talked about last week, about uh, the, the, um, the, the, if we are willing to turn around, if we are willing to come back to him and seek him with all of our heart, that's right. yeah. then he, he, he's waiting. Definitely. He's just there waiting. He's always waiting. He's always yeah. waiting. So uh, the biggest things that are stressed during this month are repentance Definitely. and forgiveness. And those are, I think, a twofold, um, they're like that yeah. twofold chord. Yeah. They, they, they're, they're part, two parts of the same coin. Right. You know, because if you don't, if, what does is, what is it say in the New Testament? Yeshua says that if you don't forgive others, then your Father them. in heaven can't forgive you. Right. Um, but also, it, ta it requires an action on our part for us to receive forgiveness from him. It requires a turning from one thing and a turning to another right, thing. Um, so the um, it's it's almost like at this time of the year we look back in order to look forward. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and again, the, let's just uh, stress something real quick that the the whole aspect of repentance. As believers in Yeshua, we always have that opportunity. That's right. yeah. The opportunity for repentance is always there. Yeah. It's not just something just that we have to wait one time of a, a year to do. Right. We always have it. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If you confess yeah. your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and right. cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's not just a one time a year thing. His blood has made atonement for us, has, has, made a, has completely wiped away our sins. And, but we have to do something to receive it, exactly. to appropriate it in our lives. Exactly, right. There's, all, there's, there's that action required on our part. Right. And, um, and like, to repent, like you said, to... Repenting isn't just, okay, one day I, or I repent, Abba, for doing that and mm -hmm. go on. Right. To repent, it's got to be a heart thing. It's got to be a heart change. You know, it's, it's not behavior modification. It's heart it's transformation. It's heart transformation. Exactly. So it's a heart, it's a whole, whole heart thing. And when it's done deep, when it's done right mm -hmm. in your heart, you mm -hmm. completely turn around, do a full right. circle, turning from that and walking forward. Right. So in essence, you're now face to face with Abba right. and your back is to that sin. That's right. So now you're walking away from that sin. Your back is turned to that sin. That's right. And that's where that sin stays forever. That's right. And, and you know, it all comes, it all comes down to um, keeping the sin in the back exactly. where, it comes to, where, where it belongs. Um, I found an interesting article about the month of Elul, and it kind of, it kind of, um, kind of a little change up from what we normally would think of it as. Yeah. Um, it says, as we have now entered into the days of Elul, it's time for a baseball analogy. Um, the start of the baseball season, opening day, take place in spring, the same time as Passover. After Passover, we begin the long journey of working out what we have started, not unlike the baseball season. It's a long summer of the daily grind of games, trying to stay on top and keep the team healthy. With Hashem, the fall means repentance and judgment. If, when we make it, we always do with the Messiah. 
we proceed to the big party at Sukkot. Sukkot is a time of joy. For baseball, the fall means the playoffs and eventually the World Series. If a team makes it all the way, it's a big celebration too. So what about Elul? Elul is our time of repentance and preparation. It's the home stretch. What we began in the spring is about to come to an end. We must put our full effort into staying on course and often make corrections for mistakes along the way. So it is with baseball. August and particularly September is where teams buck up and try to stay strong. If you are in first place, you make sure you keep winning. If you are not and you want a chance at the series, you've got to quickly right the ship and push forward strong. At one point there was a picture circulating in Red Sox, Red Sox news of a rear view mirror from a car with a Yankee symbol in the middle. Underneath the Yankee emblem was the familiar phrase, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Yikes. During Elul, we should ask, ask ourselves, what's getting close in my rear view mirror? Most likely, if we take a good look, it's sin. Sometimes we get overconfident that we have progressed through a tough time and, make steps, and have made steps forward in our spiritual walk. We have to stay strong and not let our guard down. This is Elul, and it's time to step up to the plate. I think that just uh, is such an awesome way of looking at it. Yeah. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Right. And when right. you think about that, you know, when you think Even about... Even Yeshua has said that, you know, sin is crouching at your doorstep. Exactly, right. You know? Yeah. And you think about that, like, you know, when you're driving and you look in your side view mirror and, you know, you see a car back there. Right. And then... You think you have good distance. Exactly. And then, but in, in actuality, you don't. That car is closer than what you thought. Right. So when you look at that in the, in the way of sin, and it's like, yeah. okay, well, yeah, you know, I, I look and I see that that sin has been there. Yeah. But it's that sin which tracks you that so readily entangles exactly, you. Exactly, yeah. And you're not realizing that that sin is a lot closer than it appears. Yeah. And so I think and that's if you're, And if you're not on your guard, you could easily... It's going to overtake you yeah. quickly. Exactly. Yep. If you don't keep moving forward, if you stop, that will overtake you. Exactly. And, and, and that's where we talk about if you don't move forward, you're in, you end up sliding back. Right. right. Um, but that's a story for another day. Definitely. But the... the um, I guess to know what repentance is, we got to know what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have the concept of repentance as being you get caught for a sin and, sudden, and so then you feel bad for it and you cry yeah. and, you, and, and you're all beaten down and depressed for a few days and then you, move, you pick up and move on. Right. That's yeah. not repentance. You can cry and weep and mourn over the sin that you committed for a month and it changed nothing. Exactly. You have to, true repentance means seeing the wrong that you did, seeing that it put distance between you and Abba, because ultimately sin breaks up does. our relationship exactly. with Abba. Seeing that that was wrong, admitting what you did, what does it say? You confess your sins. Right. Um, you have to admit that you did it. You can't deny that you uh, I didn't do anything no, wrong. No, that's right. You have to realize that you sinned, realize what you did, realize that it put something in between Abba. You have to want to change, and you have to make a commitment to do something different. The whole, the whole root word of repentance means a turnaround. It's like a doing a 180. You have to change your, your, change your, your direction. It's, it's like, um, I guess you have to look at it like, if I was put in that situation in which I sinned, mm -hmm. if I was put in that situation again, how would I do things differently exactly. now? Exactly. And, um, you, you know, so, so if we look at things from that perspective, it really changes a lot. Yeah, and, then, and, then, and kind of in essence, that's where the whole um, test, so to speak, of repentance mm -hmm. comes into play. Because if you have something that you did and, and you come and repent for it, and then that, that sin's ugly head rears its head mm -hmm. again the next day, and boom, you do it. Yeah. Well, then you know the day before you weren't, you weren't in, really you repenting. yourself in the right place right. for that. So people who keep going around the same tree and repent, they, they come back around, they realize they did wrong, they repent. A lot of times it's just that they got caught. Right. You know? yeah. and it, but if it's a heart transformation, you truly realize that that sin is an abomination to Abba, whatever right. it is, yeah. whatever it may be. It is something that will break your fellowship with Abba and ultimately... Fellowship with Abba is the most important thing in our lives. Definitely. Um, I, we're, let's turn over to Joel chapter 2, uh, verse 12 through 13. And um, we're going to read that real quick. And um, 
but and kind of look and see what Abba says about us turning to him. Because throughout the scriptures, there's a lot of things that talk about turn, return, um, come back to me. Uh, that's Abba's heart. He keeps calling us back into fellowship with him. Ultimately, everything that he set up is to bring us back. That's the whole, that's the whole creation story, the whole redemption story. You know, he created us, man fell. The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about bringing us back into that right fellowship with him. And, you know, it's, it, that's really what the essence of this month is about. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. All right. Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn and keep on coming to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping, with weeping and with mourning, until every hindrance is removed and the broken fellowship is restored. Rend your hearts and not your garments and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness, and he revokes his sentence of evil when his conditions are met. So that, I, I, I just, I like that scripture. Yeah. It, um, the whole thing about keep on coming to me with all your heart. And, uh, you know, if, if, if our heart is in the right place, we want to be right with Abba. If our heart is in the right place, we're open to hearing him correct us. You know, wh whom the Lord loves, he corrects. It's all out of love whenever he corrects Definitely. us for something. Yep. It's all out of love. And what is, what is the, the ultimate um, fruit of repentance? It's restoration. Exactly. It's the, the broken fellowship is restored. And then you go on down in, the, in that chapter in Joel, and I love it. It talks about in verse 25, after, after you've come, turned, after you've come back to him, after you've repented of your sin, whatever the break in the fellowship was, after you do that and you bear the fruits, as it says in Luke 3, 8, bear fruits um, that prove that you've repented. Then it says in Joel chapter 2, verse 25, I will restore for you the years that the locust has eaten, the hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the crawling locust, my great army which I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. So ultimately, it all leads back up to restoration. Definitely. That's, that's the whole goal of all the feasts. That's the whole goal of this month of Elul is restoration. Definitely. Repentance, return, and restoration. Definitely. Restoration to a place better than it was before. Exactly. Restoration to a level that your relationship with Abba has never been at before. So I encourage you all this month, uh, as we move through this month of Elul, to keep thinking of this. And um, we will probably be continuing this message next week on the broadcast. So um, join us next week and we will give you some more insight, whatever Holy Spirit shows us on this. Thank you for joining us and have an excellent week.